I do a lot of work in coffee shops, and uh, I think just the other day, a month or so ago, uh, a fellow, and if, if you've heard me speak before, I always refer to guys that I'm referring to as Bob, and women as Sue. <laughs> that helps me not give away an identity of somebody, but uh, in one of the coffee shops that I uh, work in, uh, there's a fellow who about every two months, he'll come up to me, and I'm working on my sermon, and uh, he puts a newspaper article down in front of me, and he taps on it and says to me, George, this is why I know that God does not exist. And it, it might be some terrible tragedy. I mean, he didn't do it with the terrible shooting in the synagogue in Pittsburgh, but you know, it'll be a tsunami, it'll be some terrible evil that's reported in the paper, and he puts the copy down, taps the table like this and says, George, this is why I know that God does not exist. See, one of the things he says to me is that uh, Christianity is just inconsistent and unrealistic. And it makes incoherent claims about the world and incoherent claims about God. And that's why the Christian faith, he says, is so problematic intellectually and problematic emotionally. Um, now, in, in a lot of cases, what we would do now is immediately go to show how we can prove Bob wrong. <laughs> and uh, take out my thing, and I wheel my couple of fantastic points, and he goes off defeated. Um, but before we go any further, we have to really listen to Bob and I really admire the fact that he's honest with me and he'll come and point articles like this to me. Um, but we really have to actually listen to how, sometimes we talk about this, and, and he, he talks about it something like this. Um, you see, Christians believe that the Lord is all-powerful and that he is present and active in his creation. That's what we believe. Christians believe that the Lord is all-powerful and that he is present and active in his creation. Christians also believe that the Lord is good and loving, merciful and just, without contradiction or inconsistency. And what that means is he never has to say, ah, should I be good right now or loving? Or he doesn't have to say, should I be merciful right now or should I be just? Should I be merciful or should I be good? That that there's never any contradiction in God in terms of how he, he acts. He's perfectly good all the time, perfectly loving all the time, perfectly merciful all the time, and perfectly just all of the time. He's unfailingly each of those things. That's what Christians believe. But the problem is that in this world, suffering and evil exist. Suffering and evil exist. In fact, Christianity is really unique because we don't say that it's an illusion or that it's just some false consciousness. Uh, we acknowledge that evil and suffering really, really do exist. They're not just a figment of our imagination. So what Bob would say to me on a regular basis is he would say that if the first thing is true and the second thing is true and the third thing is true, well, they can't all be true at the same time. There's a very, very big problem. You see, he would say to me that if the Lord is good and loving, merciful and just, there would be no suffering and evil. Uh, he would say that what just happened to Jimmy's son and his family would not have happened. That if, in fact, God is good and loving and merciful and just, then there wouldn't be prolonged sexual abuse of children by their parents. And there wouldn't be genocide. And there wouldn't be sex trafficking and there wouldn't be birth death defects, and there wouldn't be the possibility of people dying in great pain. So Bob would say to us, if he was able to be here, that if God exists, he may be all-powerful, but he's not good. And if that's the case, if God actually does exist, and he's not good, then we should rebel against God and fight against him but you absolutely never trust him or worship him. There's another possibility as well, of course, Bob would say. Maybe God does exist, 
And uh, he is good and loving and merciful and just. And he is completely and utterly against what happened to Jimmy and his son and his family. And he's completely against sexual abuse of children and genocide and birth defects. He's completely against all of those things, but he's weak. He's just, he might be strong, but he's not strong enough. He's weak. And um, he's ineffective. And again, Bob would say to me and to us, why would we trust or worship a weak and ineffective God? Like, why would we? So you see, the problem from Bob's point of view, you see why he shows me news articles of great evil, because he wants to help me stop incoherent and inconsistent life. He would say that the God described by Christians cannot exist. Our story and our doctrine is inconsistent and incoherent, and this is why Christianity is so weak in the face of evil and suffering, and this is why Christianity cannot be true. Now that I've cheered you all up, we'll all go home. <laughs> Before I say a few words about how I talk to Bob, um, let me just acknowledge before you that many Christians are afraid of questions. And we get very defensive when people challenge us. And we get very, very, very bothered when people point out what looks like inconsistencies to them. And I just want to say on behalf of the organizers and the sponsors that I am really glad you are here. And I hope when the time comes to be asking questions, you ask the toughest questions that you know, honest, tough questions. Because we are trying to model as Christians how Christians should not be defensive or mad or angry when people point out our inconsistencies and incoherencies to us, or at least apparently so. And I invite you to point out what may or not, may, may not be an inconsistency, and I say this to the seekers who might be present, to the skeptics who might be present, present and to the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who might be present. Like, ask your questions. Uh, Jesus loved honest questions, and his followers should love honest questions as well. Now, briefly, three types of things. Um, and I have to confess that I haven't had very much success with Bob on the first one, but the three basic things are there's the myth of Switzerland, uh, there is the existential problem, and then why Jesus, very briefly. The first is the, the myth of Switzerland, uh, isn't saying that Switzerland doesn't exist, it does exist, but it's a very, very common misunderstanding by lots of people that somehow when they ask people like me questions or challenge me, that they dwell in some neutral place, some type of neutral place where they don't have to answer any types of questions, and the questions that they ask me, they don't have to answer, and that somehow or another they just live in some neutral place, and so from this neutral place they can examine what's said about this other view or some other view, but they themselves are neutral, but nobody's neutral. Everybody has some type of system or way that they live and understand right and wrong and pain and suffering and purpose in life and the meaning of life. Everybody has some view like that. And every view has to be able to answer questions raised by the question of the problem of evil. I've talked to Bob, many Bobs, and I've talked to this specific Bob that I'm thinking of right now, and he has a very, very hard time accepting this. In fact, often he'll get very mad at me, sometimes very loudly, so everybody in the coffee shop will look at me, and, uh, which is an embarrassing type of thing and makes me red-faced because I don't like being the object of attention in such a way in the coffee shop but I'm still glad that he keeps speaking to me. You see, the Christian faith, the, the problem is, you see, the reason this is such a problem, the problem of evil, is that the Christian faith has a very, very powerful account of good and evil. And the, the way, the reason that the world is the way it is, it's, it's actually a spectacularly powerful account because it not only has this spectacular meta-narrative, it has these individual wise teachings which are very, like, intellectually and emotionally and psychologically very profound. And its argument and understanding about the nature of good and evil is connected to how everything came to be, how things continue to be, and what the future will be, and what it means to live a life, and, and what it means when, when we die. And because the Christian faith has such a powerful, overarching understanding of all of these issues, it's partially why the problem of evil 
is, is such a problem, or it has to really be addressed by us. But what I say to my friend Bob is that every viewpoint, every challenger has to account for the world as it is. It has to account answering the question of the problem of evil, or it has to actually account for a very different thing about how on earth you would believe that anything good exists, and how you would understand that something's evil. This is a thing that, in fact, I've constantly been trying to push with this particular Bob, and he, he doesn't just sort of get it. And you see, part of the problem is that not only does he think he's neutral, but the, the other part of it is that he borrows Christian categories without, while well, he denies that he does. But you see, how does how do the average Canadian or how does an atheist ground something being good and something being evil? How does he account for their existence? How, how do you account for the fact that, humanly speaking, we want good to be, to win, and we don't want evil to win? How do you account for that? How do you account for the fact that if, if if you were to awake tomorrow and there was a news item on the CBC that said that yesterday in the, in the real land of Switzerland, nobody died, nobody suffered, and nothing wrong was done. Well, nobody would believe it, would they? And why is it that nobody would believe it? Christianity can tell you why nobody would believe it. But can Hinduism or Buddhism, can atheism, can secularism, can spiritualities tell you why it is that every single human being would not believe such a news account? None of us would. In fact, we would mock and make fun of anybody who did, wouldn't we? How does Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism account for and ground good and evil, pain and suffering? How do they connect that to creation and the future and how you live now? Are they consistent or inconsistent? And for my secular friends, you have shown that God does not exist, but how do you account for good and evil? How do you answer Dostoevsky, who in the 19th century said, if God is dead, all things are permissible? I've actually never read an atheist who's been able to account and answer that, if God is dead, all things are permissible. How do you account for Nietzsche, who showed another 19th century writer, this one German, who said that uh, with the death of God, there is no right and wrong, only power, only power but no right and wrong. And in fact, he mocked people in his books who tried to sneak in right and wrong, and he said, you're just Christians without acknowledging it. But we know that God is dead, and that all there is is power. As it was put very memorably in the television show Fargo, one character asks another ca character why there are no saints in the animal world. And the person looked at him puzzled, and he said, because in the animal world, there's only breakfast and supper. It's all that exists. The strong eat the weak. And how you go from the strong eating to the weak to you must love each other, now that's a great riddle, isn't it? How would you drive that? You see, it's not the case that only the Christian faith has to have an answer that can never... Uh, it's not the case that we're the only ones... They all, everybody who has a viewpoint has to deal with these issues. And I actually think that if you look at the Christian answer, and the Christian system, and then you look at Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and, and secularism and atheism, the end of the day when you look at all of these views, you will come away marveling at the coherence and the power and the beauty of the Christian faith. Because you see, most don't examine those things, and one of the things our speakers will do tonight and tomorrow is to help us think through the Christian account and the comparisons. And this leads me to my second comment. This is actually one that my friend Bob uh, often says to me. He, he acknowledges to me that he, the, the, one of the big problems with atheism is that it doesn't actually provide much of an incentive to lead a good life. You see, the problem of pain and suffering and evil and good and all of that is actually there's three more types of things that you need to ask if it's to be existentially sat satisfying. The first one is, how does your religion, spirituality, or philosophy help you when you suffer? How does it help you deal with, evil, with the evil that you do and the evil that is done to you? This, this is the real world, isn't it? In the real world, we will suffer. We have suffered, we, will, we are suffering, we will suffer. We do evil ourselves, and evil is done to us. So how does your philosophy or religion actually help you to do that, to live with it? 
Um, the three short speakers tonight, other than myself, are all bearing testimony about the answer to that particular question. And the second type of existential question is, how does your religion, spirituality, or philosophy help you to choose to do what is right, even though it means that you will suffer? Like the spirituality that you follow, the atheism that you follow, the secularism, the consumerism that you follow, does it actually, because we all, you know, we look at somebody like Martin Luther King and we think how noble and brilliant he was uh, um, and, and that how is it that he would take a path of fighting racial injustice even though he knew he would suffer? Well, how, does, your, does your system ground that? Does it encourage that? Does it make sense for you to do that? Two of our, one of our speakers tomorrow, as short speakers, will in fact bear testimony about how the gospel shapes walking towards suffering for doing right. And then the third existential question is, how does your religion or philosophy or spirituality help you to walk towards suffering to help relieve the suffering of those who suffer? How does it help you walk towards evil to fight it? Does your consumerism or your spirituality, does it mean, like we all know on a very basic level that that's the right thing to do, that to turn our eyes to suffering, to not want to fight against evil and justice, that that somehow is not a noble way, a good way to live. So does your philosophy, does your system, does your religion, does it actually ground you to do those things? You see, not only do you have to answer the problem of evil and suffering, you have to answer these three things. And in fact, two of our speakers tomorrow, two of our short speakers tomorrow, will directly address how the gospel influences that. And when you look at these questions and these three existential questions, what will strike you is the truth and beauty of the Bible and the gospel, and it will shine with compelling power. But I have one more thing to say that my friend Bob has asked me. Just before Christmas last year, he came up to me and said, uh, he always taps on my table to get my attention. <laughs> and he said, um, you're going to celebrate Christmas soon. And I said, yes. You know, this is just so much nonsense. God being born in a baby. And even if that was true, how could you possibly, you believe he was sinless, that he never sinned. Like, how on earth can you possibly relate to a man like that? I've never been able to say this to him because he doesn't want to listen and you can pray for him and the other Bobs that I speak to. But here's what I would say. Imagine that all of the people of the world gather together to accuse God of how the fact that Jesus might have come and that he is God, but he's perfect, he lives far away, and how can you understand what it means to be human? And maybe as they're sort of raising their hands and they're pointing their fingers at God, the cry goes up, let him know what it means to be part of the working class. No, let him know what it means to be poor. No, let him know what it means to own no property other than what he can carry, other than the clothes on his back. No, let him know what it means to be part of a conquered people, not a victorious people, but a conquered people. In fact, let him know what it means to live under imperial rule. Let him know what it means to live in a backwater, in a place that nobody cares about and nobody wants to go to. Let him know, our handicapped friends say. Let him never know what it means to have the love of a woman and our lesbian and gay and bisexual and transgender friends say, and let him never have sex. And others say, let him be stigmatized as mentally ill. <clears throat> let him be stigmatized as being demon-possessed. Let him be constantly misunderstood. Let him have all of his words regularly twisted. Let him be bullied and hounded by religious people. Let him be hounded by the state. Let him be watched by the authorities who wait to get him. Let him be captured because he is viewed as an enemy of the state. Let him be mocked by the police. Let him be beaten unjustly while he is in custody. Let him be de denied a lawyer and a fair trial. Let him be rejected by his people. Let him be condemned to death while he is innocent. Let him be abandoned by his friends. Let him be betrayed by a friend. Let him die young. Let painful death. Let him die a death that is cursed. Let him die a painful, agonizing death. And let his mother stand by 
helplessly watching him die that agonized death. Let him die naked, humiliated in public. Let him die while his enemies celebrate. Let him die with God not answering his prayer to not die this. there would be silence because he's already done it. Jesus is Emmanuel, God among us. He is the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one who became a curse for us. He is the one who tasted all there is to taste of death and bore evil in his person, and tasted all there is to taste of death, and rose triumphant. Consider Jesus. Jesus.